We know in quantum mechanics that all of the information about the physical system is encapsulated in the wave function psi. Psi then ought to be related to uh, physical quantities for like, like exam for example, position, velocity, and momentum of the particle. We know a little bit about the position. We know how to calculate things like the expected value of the position. And we know how to cal calculate the probability that the particle is within a particular range of positions. But what about other dynamical variables like velocity or momentum? The connection with velocity and momentum brings us to the point where we really have to talk about operators. Operators are one of our fundamental concepts in quantum mechanics, and they connect the wave function with physical quantities. But let's take a step back first and think about what it means for a quantum system to move. Um, the position of the particle, we know, say, the integral from a to b of the squared magnitude of the wave function, dx, gives us the probability that the particle is between a and b. And we know that the expected position is given by a similar expression, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of psi star of x times x times psi of x dx. Now these expressions are related, you know, by the fact that the squared magnitude of psi is the probability density function describing position, and this is really just the calculation of the expected value of x given that probability density function. Now what if I want to know what the motion of the particle is. One uh, way to consider this is suppose I have a box and if I know the particle is say here at time t equals zero, what can quantum mechanics tell me about where the particle is later? Physically speaking, you could wait until say t equals one second and then measure the position of the particle and maybe it would be here. You could then wait a little longer and measure the particle again. Maybe at that point it would be here. That, say, t equals two seconds. Or if I wait a little bit longer and measure the particle yet again at, say, t equals three seconds, maybe the particle would be up here. Now, does that mean that the particle followed a path that looked something like this? No, we know that the position of the particle is not something that we can observe at any given time with impunity because of the way the observation process affects the wave function. Back when we talked about measurement, we talked about having a wave function that looks something like this, a probability density that looks something like that, and then after we measure the, prob measure the position of the particle, the probability density has changed. If we say measure the particle to be here, the new wave function has to accommodate that new probability density function. The fact that measurement affects the system like this means that we really can't imagine repeatedly measuring the position of a particle in the same system. What we really need is an ensemble. That's the technical term for what we need. Um, what, what an ensemble means in this context is that you have many identically prepared systems. Now, if I had many identically prepared systems, I could measure the position over and over and over and over again, once per system. If I have, you know, 100 systems, I could measure the, measure the position 100 times, and that would give me a pretty good feel for what the probability density for position measurements is at the particular time when I'm making those measurements. If I wanted to know about the motion of the particle, I could do that again, except instead of taking my 100 measurements all at the same time, I would take them at slightly different times. So instead of this being the same system, this would be, these would all be, excuse me, these would all be different systems that have been allowed to evolve for different amounts of time. And as such, the motion of the particle isn't going to end up looking something like that. It's going to end up looking like some sort of probabilistic motion of the wave function in space. What we're really interested in here, <coughs> oh, sorry, I should make a note of that. Many, oops, sorry. single measurement per system. This notion of averaging over many 
identically prepared systems is important in quantum mechanics because of this effect that measurement has on the system. So what we're interested in now, in the context of something like motion, is, well, can we predict this? Can we predict where the particle is likely to be as a function of time? And yes, we can. And what I'd like to do to talk about that is to consider a quantum mechanical calculation that we can actually do, the time derivative of the expected value of position. This time derivative tells us how the center of the probability distribution, if you want to think about it that way, how the center of the wave function moves with time. So this time derivative, d by dt of the expected value of x, that's d by dt of, let's just write out the expected value of x, integral from minus infinity to infinity of x times psi star of x, psi of x, where this is the probability density function that described, or given by the wave function, and this is x, or integrating dx. Now, if you remember when we talked about normalization and whether the normalization of the wave function changed as the wave function evolved in time, we're going to do the same sort of calculation with this. We're going to do some calculus with this expression. We're going to apply the Schrodinger equation. But as before, the first thing we're going to do is move this derivative inside the equation. This is a total time derivative of something that's a function of, in principle, position and time. I should write these as functions of x and t. And what you get when you push that in is, as before, the integral, or the um, total derivative becomes a partial derivative. Since x is just the coordinate x in these contexts of, of functions of both space and time, the total time derivative will not affect the coordinate x, even when it comes, becomes a partial derivative. So what we'll end up with is x times the partial time derivative of psi star psi integral dx. Now, I'm not going to write the integral from minus infinity to infinity here just to save myself some time. Now, if you remember this expression, the integral, or sorry, not the, not the full integral, just the partial time derivative of psi star psi, that was what we worked with in the lecture on normalization. So if we apply the result from the lecture on normalization, and it's equation 126 yes, in the book, um, if we apply that, you can simplify this down a lot right off the bat. And what you end up with is i h bar over 2m times this integral x, and then what we substitute in. The equation 126 is, gives an expression for this highlighted part here in orange. And what you get is the partial derivative with respect to x of psi star partial of psi with respect to x minus partial of psi star with respect to x times psi. Integral still with respect to dx, of course. Now, if we look at this equation, we're making the same sort of progress we made when we did the normalization derivation. Um, we had time derivatives here, now we have only space derivatives, and we have only space derivatives in an integral over space. So this is definitely progress. Now we can start thinking about what we can do with integration by parts. The first integration by parts I'm going to do has the non-differential part just being x, and the differential part being dv is equal to, you know, I'm not going to have space to write this here. I've got to move stuff around a little bit. So the differential part is dv is the partial derivative, well, what's left of this equation, the partial derivative with respect to x of psi star d psi dx minus d psi dx psi, oh, sorry, d psi star dx psi. And then there's the dx from the integral. Sorry, I'm running out of space. This 
um, differential part here is just this part of the equation. Now I can take this derivative du dx in my integration by parts procedure du equals dx and dv here is easy to integrate because this is a derivative. So when I integrate the derivative there I'll just end up with v equals psi star d psi dx minus d psi star dx psi. Now when I actually apply those uh, that integration by parts. The boundary term here with the without the integral in it is going to involve these two. So I'm going to have x times psi star partial psi partial x minus partial psi star partial x psi. And that's going to be evaluated between minus infinity and infinity, the limits on my integral. And the integral part, which comes in with the minus sign, is going to Com be composed of these bottom two terms. Integral of psi star partial psi partial x minus partial psi star partial x psi and it's the integral dx from minus infinity to infinity. Now what's nice, oh you know I forgot something here, what did I forget? My leading constants. I still have this ih bar over 2m out there i h bar over 2m is multiplied by this entire expression. Now the boundary terms here vanish. The boundary terms in integration by parts in quantum mechanics will often vanish because if you're evaluating something at say infinity, psi has to go to zero at infinity, so this term is going to vanish. Psi star has to go to zero at infinity, so this is going to vanish. So even though x is going to infinity, psi is going to zero. And if you dig into the mathematics of quantum mechanics you can show convincingly that the limit as x times psi goes to infinity is going to be zero. So this boundary term vanishes both at infinity and at minus infinity and all we're left with is this. Yes, all you're left with is that. <coughs> so I'll write that over i h bar over 2m times the integral of psi star partial psi partial x minus partial psi star partial x psi integral dx. Um, I'm actually going to split that up into two separate integrals. So I'll stick another integral sign in here and I'll put a dx there and I'll put parentheses around everything so my leading constant gets multiplied in properly. And now I'm going to apply integration by parts again but this time just to the second integral here. So here we're going to say u is equal to psi and dv is equal to, again using the fact that when we do this integral, if we can integrate a derivative that potentially simplifies things. So this is going to be partial psi star partial x dx. So when we derivative, take the derivative of this, we're going to get du is equal to partial psi partial x. And when we integrate this, we're going to get v equals psi star. Now, when we do the integration, when we write down the answer from this integration by parts, so the boundary term here, psi star times psi, is going to vanish, again, because we're evaluating it at a region where both psi star and psi, um, well, vanish. So the boundary term vanishes, and you notice I have a minus sign here. When we do the integration by parts, the integral term has a minus sign in it here. So we're going to have the partial psi with respect to x and psi star with a minus sign coming from the integration by parts and a minus sign coming from the leading term here. So we're going to end up with a plus sign there. So we get a minus from the integral part. Um, what that means though is that I have psi star and partial psi partial x in my integration by parts I end up with partial psi partial x and psi star. It's the same. And the fact that I had a minus and another minus means I get a plus. So I have two identical terms here. The result of this then is i h bar over m. I'm adding a half and a half and getting one basically times the integral of psi star partial psi 
partial x dx. And this is going to be something that I'm going to call now the expectation of the velocity vector, the velocity operator. This is the sort of thing that you get out of operators in quantum mechanics. You end up with expressions like this. And this I'm sort of equating just by analogy with the expectation of a velocity operator. This is not really a probability distribution anymore, at least not obviously. We started with the probability distribution due to psi, the absolute magnitude of psi squared. And we end up with the partial derivative on one of the psi's. So it's not obvious that this is a probability distribution anymore. And well, it's the probability distribution in velocity, and it's giving you the expected velocity in some sense in a quantum mechanical sense. So this is really a more general sort of thing. We have the velocity operator, the expectation of the velocity operator. Oh, and uh, operator-wise, I will try to put hats on things. Uh, I will probably forget. I don't have that much attention to detail when I'm making lectures like this. The hat notation means operator. If you see something that you really sure is an operator but it doesn't have a hat, that's probably just because I made a mistake. But this expression for the expectation of the velocity operator is the one we just derived, minus i h bar over m times the integral of psi star partial derivative of psi with respect to x integral dx. Now it's customary to talk about momentum instead of velocity. Momentum has more meaning because it's a conserved quantity in, under you know most physics. So we can talk about the momentum operator, the expectation of the momentum operator. And I'm going to write this momentum operator expression in a slightly more suggestive way. The integral of psi star times something in parentheses here, which is minus i h bar, partial derivative with respect to x, and I'm going to close the parentheses there, put a psi after it, and a dx for the integral. You have the same sort of expression for the position operator. We were just writing that as the expected value of position without the hat earlier. But that's going to be the integral of psi star what goes in the parentheses now is just x psi dx. So this you recognize is the expectation of the variable x, uh, subject to the probability distribution given by psi star times psi. Uh, this is slightly more subtle. You have psi star and psi, which looks like a probability distribution, but what you have in the parentheses now is very obviously an operator that does something. It does more than just multiply by x it multiplies by minus i h bar and takes the derivative of psi. Um, operators in general do that. We can write them as, say, x hat equals x times, where there's very obviously something that has to go after the x in order for it to be considered an operator. Or we can say the same for v hat. It's minus i h bar over m times the partial derivative with respect to x, where there obviously has to be something that goes here. Likewise for momentum, um, minus i h bar partial derivative with respect to x. Something has to go there. Um, another example of an operator is the kinetic energy operator. Usually that's written as t. And that's minus h bar squared over 2m. You can think of it as the momentum operator squared. Um, it's got a second derivative with respect to x. And again, there very obviously has to be something that goes there. The operator acts on the wave function. That's what I said back when I talked about the fundamental concepts of quantum mechanics, and this is what it means for the operator to act on the wave function. The operator itself is not meaningful. It's only meaningful in the context when it's acting on a wave function. In general, oh, wrong color. In general, the expectation value of some operator, which I'll just call q, is going to be the integral of psi star q psi dx, where q acts on the psi. And this is what allows us to, say, predict the expected value of really any physical quantity. You need to know how to write that physical quantity in terms of operators. And typically, uh, typically this q hat here will be written as 
you know, something with x hat, the position operator, and p hat, the momentum operator. So the operators can in principle be quite complicated, but they're generally expressed in terms of simpler operators like position and momentum. To give an example of how this is actually used, suppose I want to find the expected value of the momentum for the wave function given by psi. Um, psi here is that wave function that I talked about back in the normalization example, um, where I found what the value of a was to normalize this wave function properly. I'm just going to leave it as a for now and deal with the wave function part. It's also important to note that this wave function has no time dependence and it has no complex part. So I'm simplifying things a lot. You will work with wave functions that look a lot like this under specific conditions, but know that this isn't a general wave function. This isn't a solution to any particular Schrodinger equation. This is just something that I'm, I'm cooking up as an example. It is a valid wave function, at least if you consider it at, say, t equals zero. The goal is to find p hat expected value. And the expected value of something, you know, expected value of p hat is given by the integral of psi star p hat psi dx, which is the integral, and this integral would be from minus infinity to infinity, but since my wave function is zero for x greater than, for absolute value of x greater than one, I'm going to drop the condition here and make my integral only go from minus one to one. And for psi star, I have a, complex conjugate of a, assuming it's real, 1 minus x squared, complex conjugate of 1 minus x squared, x is real, no complex conjugate, or complex conjugate has no effect here, times the momentum operator, which is going to be i h bar minus i h bar, partial derivative with respect to x, of psi without the complex conjugate, a, 1 minus x squared, all integrated dx. Now I can simplify this a little bit. You end up with the integral from minus 1 to 1. Oh, sorry, let me pull my i h bar out front. Minus i h bar integral from minus 1 to 1 of, ooh, I can pull out the a squared as well. Integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1 minus x squared times the second, or sorry, the, the derivative now of 1 minus x squared. Well, the derivative of 1 this is a sum, so I can push the derivative in. So the derivative of 1 is 0, and the derivative of minus x squared is minus 2x. So I'm going to have a minus 2x here, I'll just write 2x, and I'll put a plus sign out front to compensate for the minus sign. And this is integrated dx. This then is i h bar, let's say 2 i h bar, I can pull the 2 out as well, a squared, integral from minus 1 to 1 of x minus x cubed dx. Now right away, hopefully you can look at this and say x minus x cubed. This is an odd function, meaning if I actually plotted this, it would look something like this. This is my coordinate system, x minus x cubed, it's going to look something like this, where um, f of x equals minus f of minus x. What that means is when I integrate this from minus 1 to 1 over an interval that starts equally far into the negative side as it goes into the positive side, I'm going to get 0. Um, so you can just write down just by looking at this that the integral is going to be 0. Um, you can also, of course, plug this in. You'll get x squared over 2 and x to the fourth over 4 for these integrals, and then you'll plug in minus 1 and 1 and find out that minus and plus doesn't make any difference for x squared and x to the fourth, and you'll end up with 0 that way as well. But the bottom line here is that the expected value of momentum is equal to zero. And this makes sense. The reason this makes sense is that my wave function is symmetric. If that's a coordinate system, we can say this is the x-axis. If this is going to be my wave function, could look, oops, I don't want the ruler. My wave function would look something like this. where it goes from minus 1 to 1, and it's 0 outside of that range. Now, if you had an expected value of momentum that was non-zero here, that would suggest that the wave function was on average moving. And if you look at this wave function, psi 
it doesn't really seem to be moving. There's no preferred direction to this. If you, if you showed me this sign and asked, is it moving to the left or to the right, I wouldn't be able to tell you. And it makes sense then that the expected value of the momentum is zero. The wave function is effectively not moving, or the particle represented by this wave function has no momentum on average. Now this doesn't mean that if you measure the momentum of the particle as described by this wave function, you would always get zero. It just means you would get zero on average. So that's a little bit about operators, and we'll be working with operators much more in the future. The basic concepts that I want you guys to take away from this lecture is that the expected value of some general operator is what you get if you take psi star and psi and sandwich your operator in between them and integrate. And then know that the operator may actually do something to psi. It's not just a multiplication. So I cannot say that this q hat is equal to the integral of q hat psi star psi dx. I can't just move the q around. I'm not allowed to do that because q is acting on this psi. Um, really, this is just reasoning by analogy right now. There is no rigorous formal proof. We'll come back to discuss the math of quantum mechanics quite a lot later on. But that's it for this lecture. As a check your understanding, I'd like you to find the expected value of the kinetic energy operator for this wave function. Um, remember that the kinetic energy operator t hat is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative with respect to x. And I almost wrote a psi there, but I'm not supposed to write a psi. The operator has to act on psi. So there should be some space here for psi to go. So go back to that same formula for the expectation, use the kinetic energy operator instead, and calculate the expected value of the kinetic energy for this wave function.